Okay, this section's about limits at infinity or to infinity. Um, and there's sort of two ways that these things can happen. So let me draw pictures first, because that it's always easier to talk about things when you have an idea of what they look like. So a, a graph can have a limit as you approach infinity, right? If it has a horizontal asymptote somewhere, something like this. We might have vertical asymptotes too. And so if the inputs approach infinity, that means I'm getting far away from the, the middle of the graph and the function values are getting closer and closer to this horizontal asymptote at infinity. So that's, that's a limit as the x values go to infinity. Um, same thing can happen if you get far away from the x-axis to the left. You have limits as you approach negative infinity with the x values. Um, you can have limits as the y values approach infinity, like if this is at, say, 1. You can have limits as I approach 1 from the left. The function values are getting higher and higher and higher, and they're unbounded, so I have a limit that goes to infinity there. Um, similarly, if I approach one from the right or from the left, the function values are getting smaller and smaller, or more and more negative, lower and lower and lower on the graph. So I am approaching uh, a limit at negative infinity there, as we approach an x value of one. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on with these things. And when you have limits at infinity, you have either vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, maybe oblique asymptotes, or some sort of thing like that. Um, some graphs, right, as I approach infinity with my inputs, the outputs also approach infinity, or as you approach negative infinity with the inputs, the outputs approach negative infinity. But you're looking for these things that happen far away from the axes, far away from the origin. Okay, so let's write some actual uh, limit definitions. And we'll have four definitions for these things. Well, we could have eight if we wanted to, but um, let's just start with uh, four. So let's take the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, and we're going to say that's equal to L. So we say that this thing is a true statement. This numerical sentence is a statement if uh, for all epsilon bigger than zero, right? So that's my my tolerance, my my vertical strip or my horizontal strip tolerance around the output. If there is an x in the reals such that for all. Uh, again, these upside down a's are for all. For all, let's call this an x naught, so it's a specific x naught. For all x bigger than x naught, so if I'm farther out to the right along the x axis, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, so picture wise, um, lightning bolts like on axes mean that there was a big skip somewhere so I've got stuff going on here there's this skip and then maybe this is at L and I've got the graph sort of smooths down between L here and I've got my little epsilon strip around L L plus epsilon L minus epsilon and I want to be in this horizontal strip forever after some point, right? Any of these guys can be x here, right? As long as this is x naught. As long as I'm further to the right of x naught, the graph is in this strip. Okay, that's what that says. If I go far enough to the right, I will always be in this epsilon strip. If I make epsilon smaller, I might have to go farther to the right. I have to pick a different x not value to always be within that epsilon strip because I've made the epsilon strip smaller. I might have to go to the right farther. Okay. 
Similar idea for the left um, if I'm going towards negative infinity. So let's write that down. Uh, the limit as x goes to negative infinity f of x equals L if for all epsilon bigger than zero there exists backwards e upside down a's are for all backwards e's are there exist um, x not in the reals such that whenever um, x is uh, sorry less than x not in this case because I'm trying to go to the left I'm trying to go to the left so I want x less than x not we get the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So if I go far enough to the left, right, x naught on the x-axis is here. If I go over here somewhere, here's an x. I'm in this horizontal strip with that function as long as I'm to the to the left of x naught. So maybe I have to be down in there. but I will be in that strip forever and I don't care what happens over here to the right of x naught but to the left of x naught I would have to be in that strip and if epsilon gets smaller maybe I have to start further out to the left Okay, the other two we've got limits to infinity like the the outputs are going to infinity these were both inputs go to infinity or negative infinity we should have some sort of a definition where I have the outputs going towards infinity or negative infinity. So um, we say the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity. And this would be read as the limit of f of x as x approaches C diverges to infinity if, and here comes the math statement, if for all x naught in R there is delta such that um, Whenever x minus c is less than delta, f of x is bigger than x naught. Okay, so we're starting to see some some general themes here. All right. If I want to get close to infinity, that means that there is a bigger value no matter which big value you already pick right so in this case this is further to the right than this big value that I already picked in this case I'm trying to go to negative infinity so this is a bigger negative value than this big negative value that we already picked and in this case I get to I get to pick any really big value and I can find a function value that's bigger than that really big value as long as I'm close enough to delta. So, graphically, what's going on? Here's C. We want to approach positive infinity as I get close to C. I come up with some really big positive value and I want to make sure that the function is always above that positive value. I want to be up above this as long as I get close enough to C. And it looks like in this case, as long as I'm within this distance from C, I will be above that, that big positive value, and that's going to be what our delta is. This is going to be C minus delta, C plus delta. So as long as I can get close enough to C, I will be able to say that my function values are above this x naught value. That's that whole thing. So for the, the limit towards negative infinity, what we're going to do, we're going to pick a big negative value and we're going to make sure that we always end up down here as long as I'm close enough to C. So our limit as x gets close to C, f of x equals negative infinity or diverges to negative infinity if 
for all x naught in R. These time, this time these x naught are going to be thought of as really big negative values, but we can find there exists a, a delta bigger than zero, so that if x minus c is less than uh, a delta, then f of x, um, don't need absolute value, f of x is less than x naught. Um, thinking about this more, I should probably call these y values, right, because these are, these are output values that I'm thinking about. That would be y naught in this case. Maybe this is a, a y naught here. Y naught. Um, uh, sorry, th that one's still an x, isn't it? Because that corresponds to input values getting really big. So here the input values get really big, so we, we, we get them close to infinity by being either really big compared to another really big number or small compared to another really big number. These are y values, they're output values, so I'm going to compare the outputs of the function to those big output values or the the big negative output values that we have chosen. Okay, so that's that's the idea of what these limits towards infinity are. Um, we could put together some more where your inputs go to infinity and your outputs go to infinity, but they, they work sort of the same way in the sense that um, the epsilons and deltas, they bound stuff close towards something. The, the x naughts and the y naughts that we've chosen here push things far out towards infinity, so they're, they're in some sense close to infinity with those. Um, and let's talk a little bit about these asymptotes then. Um, and we can do some one-sided limits as well. So a horizontal asymptote occurs if the limit of f of x as x goes to infinity approaches some c value, right? And that c value here, we can draw a dotted line, and all that says is, if I get close to infinity, say, or uh, if I get close to negative infinity, so if I go far out on the graph in either direction, I can get a function value that gets closer and closer to this dotted line, right? It gets closer and closer to that dotted line, we usually draw the dotted line and we draw an arrow that looks like it's getting closer and closer to it. In here in the middle we don't know what it does. It has to still be a function so it can't kind of do that thing. So let's fix that a little bit, but we can still go up and down and cross that, that, vert that horizontal asymptote as much as we want as long as as I get close to infinity or as I get close to negative infinity I approach that dotted line. We still want it to be a function because we say f is a function. Okay, vertical asymptotes are similar. We call um, x equal to a a vertical asymptote, and this is y equals c. Right. Y equals c because the outputs get close to c. Y values get close to c. X equals a a vertical asymptote if the limit as x gets close to a, f of x equals plus or minus infinity, or the limit x gets close to a from above or below, f of x equals plus or minus infinity. And that picture, as I'm getting close to a, right, the functions, they get really, really big, or they get really, really small, and we still draw them that way. Okay, horizontal asymptotes, the function can actually cross it, but vertical asymptotes, every input corresponds to exactly one output, and in some sense, the output at this input is infinity, and I can't really do anything other than put that one point in at infinity, or maybe it's defined somewhere, but I still have an asymptote there. 
but I can only have one point there, so it's not going to actually cross through a vertical asymptote. And then there's another type of asymptote called oblique asymptotes. And I'm going to set this up a little bit by talking about some rational functions a little. So if you have, uh, say, a degree uh, 4 polynomial, and you've got it divided by a degree 3 polynomial, well, we know that when we multiply polynomials, we get something that has uh, a degree, which is the sum of the earlier degrees, right? If I'd multiply degree 3 times degree 4, I would get degree 7. If I multiply degree 1 times degree 2, I get degree 3. Right? So if you divide them, it should be the opposite. So if I divide degree 4 by de degree 3, I should get something that's approximately a degree 1 polynomial. right? So I should get something that looks like mx plus b, approximately. Um, well, if you have... Uh, the numerator has one more degree than the denominator. You're going to get this this linear thing that this should be about like. And that's where these oblique asymptotes come from. So I get an oblique asymptote, and I'll draw it as a dotted line actually. And if the function sort of it approaches this diagonal line as you get far out towards infinity or negative infinity, and we don't know necessarily what happens here in the middle. Maybe I've got a vertical asymptote and it goes off that way and it goes off this way. But if this isn't like a horizontal y equals c line, this is maybe something like y equals. Uh, well, that looks flatter than 2x, so maybe that's like one-third x plus 2, right? This would be a hor uh, an oblique asymptote for this, this type of function. And how we find that is we, we perform this long division, and we see what this thing would be that it's approximately like. So let's do a real quick example of that. So example... Let's look at, say, x squared plus x plus 1. That's a degree 2. And I'm going to divide it by x uh, minus 1. And we're going to call this f of x. And this is going to have an oblique asymptote. We're going to figure out where it is. It looks like degree 2 over degree 1. Uh, this doesn't factor on the top, so it's not going to be able to be canceled or anything. I don't get 0 over 0 anywhere. Um, so we're going to do long division. We're going to take x minus 1 and we're going to divide it into x squared plus x plus 1. So divide the numerator by the denominator. You get an x, you get an x squared minus x. Subtract that off just like your normal division algorithm. Um, this becomes a 2x and I've still got a plus 1 so this becomes a plus 2. And then uh, this is 2x minus 2 you subtract that off and you get a 3, so this is a remainder of 3 because this has degree 0, this has degree 1. As soon as the degree of the thing that I'm dividing by is is bigger than the, the thing that I'm trying to divide it into, we're done. Um, and so I could rewrite this fraction, all right, because we've done this long division. What this says is the fraction is x plus 2 plus that little remainder that hasn't been divided by the divisor yet, right? So you get, this is the quotient, this is the remainder over the divisor. Okay, and I have perfect equality there, right? Just like if I took seven over three, that's equal to two plus one over three. There's my quotient, there's my remainder, there's my divisor. It's the same idea with these polynomials. We we take a improper fraction. The degree is bigger than the degree. The degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. And we turn it into a a mixed number in some sort of sense, where I've got a polynomial and I've still got a rational function. 
with this rational function, the numerator has a smaller degree than the denominator, so it's a proper rational function. Okay. As x gets really, really big, either positive or negative, the denominator of the of the of the sort of extra, the leftover, the remainder divided by the divisor, because the degree is smaller on top than the bottom, this thing would go to zero. This thing goes to zero as x gets really, really big positive or really, really big negative. So in some sense, the only part of the fraction that matters is this quotient bit. This bit goes to zero, and this is the part that really matters. So if I was to graph this, as I get farther and farther away from the middle of the graph, this stuff on the right gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so the graph of the function is going to look more and more and more like just the graph of the quotient. Right? There's only going to be a tiny bit that happens with this stuff, and the quotient's going to kind of take over in the graph. And that's where we get these oblique asymptotes. So if I was to graph this, I would graph x plus 2, and then I have this 3 over x minus 1, so the graph is going to look a lot like this line, x plus 2, plus this 3 over x minus 1 stuff. So I'm going to have a vertical asymptote at 1. And as I get farther and farther away from, from the origin, I'm going to get closer and closer to that vertical line. Um, if I'm to the right of 1, this remainder is going to be positive. And the closer I get to 1, the closer that remainder is to infinity. So I'm going to be up here going towards positive infinity. This value is going to be really close to infinity as I get close to 1 from the right. From the left, that's going to be a negative value because if I'm less than 1, x minus 1 is going to be negative. And so I'm going to get really big negative values as I come in from the left. But this graph is going to kind of turn over and get close to that x plus 2 again. And my oblique asymptote, oblique asymptote is at uh, y equals x plus 2. Okay, So you find these oblique asymptotes by taking the quotient when you do the long division of the rational function. All right. We can also talk a little bit about uh, asymptotic behavior. If I don't have just uh, a single degree difference in the rational function, maybe I have like x to the fourth plus something something plus one, and then I've got maybe an x squared down here. All right. Um, so now there's a degree two difference. And so that quotient, it's still going to be the same idea where you've got the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. And this stuff is going to go to zero as x gets big. And so it's going to look just like the quotient again. And in this case, my quotient's going to be degree two. So the graph of this, I'm going to find out what the quotient is. I'm going to graph the quotient going to have some sort of a quadratic and then this remainder over divisor maybe puts in asymptotes somewhere. So as I get far off it's going to look like that that quotient but maybe it sort of looks like this type of thing and then does that sort of deal maybe. Okay. So depending on what the the divisor is and what the quotients are, it's going to be shaped generally away from the middle of the graph, like the, in this case, parabola. Or if it was degree 5 over degree 2, it'd be a cubic, right? But then in the middle of the graph, the, the remainder over the divisor is going to have a, a bigger effect on things than if I was far away from the, the middle of the graph and closer to x is plus or minus infinity. Okay, that's the general idea of all of this limits towards infinity stuff. Um, I'm going to do quite a few examples in the next video.